All right, so we're back. Um, it's Comp 391, and it's week two, uh, lesson two, part one. And really, um, a couple of things I want to talk about first. Uh, in terms of organization, we're gonna, I'm going to give you guys your first assignment on Friday. So I'll give you details of what I'm expecting and so on. Um, so just be prepared for that. A um, couple of things out that we're going to take care of. Um, two things. Just like normal, we're going to do two halves. This first half is, we're, I'm going to try and finish off uh, this, this piece of the book without talking so much. Sorry, I got really excited last uh, couple of videos, so we're talking, 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 talking about the uh, uh, kind of different platforms and stuff. And then uh, hopefully I can finish um, chapter two today, right, of the book. Um, I'd like to try and do that. I was supposed to kind of finish it last day, but, you know, it's okay. We got lots of time. And then hopefully start into chapter three of the book by Friday. Right, so that's what I, my, my hopes uh, is to get into that. So that way you have enough detail. Um, so I'm kind of going to go chapter by chapter just for these, these few parts in the beginning so that way we're, we're going. And then the test, the first test will be on, you know, these few weeks, right, the stuff we've learned. Some of it will be Blender. Some of it will be, you know, multiple choice, true, false, da, 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 on uh, some of the game history and all that kind of stuff. I did end up watching that Netflix um, documentary. Have you watched it? Anyone watched it? You've seen it? Yeah? I think, and if you've if you ever watched it, the, just to give you an overview of what it is, um, it's called Atari Endgame or something like that. Let's see if I can bring it up. Atari Endgame. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's the extraterrestrial stuff. It definitely is a... Um, it gives you almost like a, it's a documentary about. Uh, um, let's see if I can pull it up with my Netflix. I'm gonna get killed for doing this on uh, on YouTube, but um, let's see if I can pull up Netflix to show it to you. I'm not gonna actually play the video at all because I won't be allowed to do that. Yeah, it's called sorry, it's Atari Game Over. Is what it is. And what it is, it's they talk about um, this on Netflix. It talks about. Um, really the demise of the gaming industry in the 1980s, like late 1980s. We talked about this kind of like how things um, went up and then they went down. Um, so Atari Game Over is what it's called. Let's see if I can pull up the Game Over. Probably have something like that. TV episode 2014, that's the one. Um, so what they did, um, now they didn't re rate it that great on IMDb, but they really have these the original um, kind of creators of some of these these video games, like the original video games, uh, you know, things like Donkey Kong and, and those kind of things. They have these things. And, um, you know, they talked about how it was a great place to work, working at Atari back in the 80s, right? And how really things fell apart. Um, this one creator, the creator of... of um, E.T., the extraterrestrial, because, you know, how many times have you guys played games that are based off of some movie, right? And they suck. Every time. It's like you buy a game and it sucks because it's made off of a movie. It's almost like they've bypassed the reason for the game to be, to exist, and they've just kind of made it because it's like, you know, the big success of the movie. A good, good example of that would be Avatar. You know, ever play a game like that? the Avatar game? It's terrible, right? Batman, Superman, you know, any one of these superhero uh, things... Occasionally, they come up with some really good uh, games that are based off of comic books, like, you know, uh, Gods Among Us. You know, that's kind of a better, you know, kind of duke them. You got you to gotta duke it out with, you know, with the other stuff, right? Uh, but, you know, in general, when you have a game that's directly made, like Indiana Jones or some kind of weird Star Wars game, most Star Wars games, like, meh, they're okay, you know? Force Unleashed is probably one of the best ones, um, you know, renditions of a Star Wars game. But it wasn't made from a movie. It's a game in the in the Star Wars universe, right? But if it was, if you ever play like Star Wars, um, you know, any one of the actual Star Wars games, you know, unless it was back in the 80s with the original Star Wars games, they were kind of meh, you know, even those. Like, you know, so very rare that you have a movie game that's cool. Anyways, this one, they made this thing. E.T. the Extraterrestrial was a movie made by... Um, back in the day it was really super popular um a great actually it was a really good movie back in the day it was made by steven spielberg and stuff and he it was one of his kind of i would say one of his best movies 
And, um, of course, Atari was swinging. They were going crazy at the time in, in, uh, in the 80s. And uh, they were producing games like Gangbusters, these cartridge games, right? Remember, we talked about the cartridge being almost like a daughter board on top of the motherboard, and the motherboard as it would clip in, and then it would, you, know, you could activate the game. Um, and there was a whole process involved in putting together a game, like a cartridge game. And I was the, the, the guy who created the, the games. Let me see if I can pull up the cast and crew here. Um, was that Zach? Who was it that actually did it? He was the, the co-founder co of Atari was on there too, Nolan Bushnell. He was the actual, he was in there. So if you want to see this thing, it's actually very interesting because um, they, they really talked about how, um, you know, these game designers, the, the, these are the original game designer, right? That, that kind of started producing games with, you know, with a different kind of workflow than we have today. Like there was no title game designer back in the 80s, right? But these guys kind of made it out. And they had a really weird environment. Like they had things like they would go into work and, hey, it, was, it wasn't uncommon for them to, you know, to smoke up, right? You know, it was just a thing to do back then, you know, to do the... Uh, uh, smoking at work. I mean, cigarettes and marijuana and anything else you wanted, drinking, and it was a big party to go work there at Atari, right? And they, they talked about that. I was trying to see who it was. I uh, hear it is this game engineer, Howard Scott Warshaw. Um, anyways, this dude, he created this this game, this um, this ET game, and he created other ones um, like um, um, Yar's Revenge would be the one that he was, he was most famous for. And they sold millions of units of these things, like millions of dollars. And it was at the time, Atari was overselling the 2600. And they kind of talked about it in the, in the documentary, how was it E.T., the extraterrestrial, this game, movie game, a, a game that was made from a movie that kind of was the downfall of Atari, um, so-called the worst game ever, right? Uh, because they sold 4 million units and, and the stores wanted to return these 4 million units, right? And of course, what do they do? They buried it in the desert, all these, these cartridges, right? It's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, in uh, uh, Alamo, Alamogordo, this place in, in, uh, in New Mexico, right? Um, and so they had this big, like, you know, dump that, you know, people will go to. This is what this thing is all about. Um, the neat thing is that they kind of said, well, maybe it was partly because of this. I mean, can you imagine being the game designer, which is, you know, you blame for being like the downfall of all the video games in the 1980s. It's huge, right? He had to live with that for, you know, since then. Uh, he's had a different job, right? He's obviously not a game designer anymore, uh, being infamous for bringing down Atari, right? Uh, but it really, you know, I, th I think what they, they came up with in the, in the documentary was, was it really his fault? Probably not. I think Atari committed suicide is what they kind of said, right? It wasn't a homicide. It wasn't like that, you know, he killed Atari. It was that they really committed suicide by producing too many Atari 2600s and, sell, and overselling this thing where it was a market that was saturated at the time for the number of people that were interested in doing this kind of, you know, uh, uh, video game thing. So very interesting documentary if you want to see more. Um, some pieces of it are, of course, dramatized. So whenever you watch documentary, you know, I always take it with a grain of salt because they're trying to add a drama, a storyline, or whatever. I think the, my favorite parts was actually looking back when, when you see videos of these people talking about, you know, the industry, the, you know, Atari, and, and how, what was it like to be an Atari, and this whole philosophy of being a game designer and everything else. They're very flamboyant, the way they were talking, which is kind of interesting, uh, you know, at the time. So really good historical documentary. Again, you can catch it on Netflix if you, uh, if you subscribe. Um, and you know what? It's for what it is. It's it's. I think it's it's kind of uh, relevant to what we're doing here when we talk about stuff history. So that's one of the things. Um, so we also wanted to ask you, what? How do you feel about um, Blender? I know we've been talking Blender the last couple of days. Are you guys good with it? Have you been practicing? Have you touched it again? I know I was talking to Vanessa. Vanessa says no. She got busy. <laughs> She got bored of Blender already, right? And she doesn't want to touch it again. No, I'm joking. She just she just says that you know there was no time, right? Are you guys? I, I really urge you to, to play with it more. And I know that this is just one class out of six, I'm guessing, or seven for some people. It's crazy, but um, I really urge you to be make it part of your workflow for the day. Like I know I got maybe I can give you more assignments to do uh, to make you do it. I don't recommend that, right? Because it'll just be more stuff for you to do, and you'll be forced. And I hate being forced to do things. Um, but there are there is going to be an assignment that I'm going to hand out, like I said, by Friday, and hopefully it'll help you um, to kind of continue working with Blender and 
and uh, you know understand some of the stuff we're talking about. All right. Any questions before we continue? Because we kind of ended off with this mobile and handheld games uh, kind of idea and how there's different kinds of games. This is where we ended up uh, last time. And of course, there was this big convergence between uh, Xbox 360, PlayStation, and the Wii. These are the big ones that came up um, back in the day. They were, they were big. Now, of course, it's the Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and the Wii U, right? Um, with, of course, the Wii U being the weakest of them. But today, what I want to talk about is platforms and player modes, right? <coughs> so last day, or last week actually, and one of the one of the first the first day was kind of an intro day. We did that, so we spent some time doing that. We talked about historical elements and how we how we got to where we are today in terms of the game industry. And today we're gonna go focus more on hopefully we'll be able to fi finish a lot of this uh, to get us into more about platforms and player modes and, and what the hell is a framework anyway, right? So without further ado, let's unless you guys have any questions, we'll kind of start in on that. If you can sign in for those people who came in a little later, I'm going to pass that down, just because that way we're all on the same page. All right, so we're going to talk about the types of platforms available for different games. When we're talking about platforms, we're talking about you know uh, console, you know computer, PC, th those kind of things, uh, mobile. Um, all that stuff, and of course, so so hardware is one one piece, and the other piece is player modes. You know the difference between single player and multiplayer, and how it affects our game design choices, right? Because I think as game designers, and this is what we're going to be, or developers, we have to keep in mind, you know, when we want to make um, an option to have a game that's multiplayer. And here's a question I'll put out for you guys, and you know, and, and our single girl that's in the class. Um, do you think? It would be an afterthought. Like, do you think if we were going to play, make a game today, all of us, we sit down and plot a game. You guys be part of the planning process. That we would make it single player and then say, hey, you know what? When the single player mode works, let's make multiplayer mode. Is that do you think that's how we would plan it out? Yeah. yeah. It's absolutely the other way around. We when we plot a game, if I'm going to do some planning in the concept phase, we want to try and figure this out. We want to say. Okay, definitely we're going to have multiple multiplayer. Definitely it's going to be online, right, with some kind of server. Definitely we're going to have some AI. You know, if you know, I think we have to have some kind of AI or non-player characters uh, in the in the uh, in the game. Okay, how do we do this? We can we also develop a single-player campaign, like I said, right? Almost like a single-play mode. It's almost like two different games, right? Um, I don't know if you ever if you've experienced this. You know, you play an online game. And the difference between the P, uh, player versus player, PvP mode, and uh, you know single player mode is like night and day. It's like totally different. It's almost like there is there are two separate games going on at the same time, right? Um, they probably share some parts of the server or whatever, and you might have players that pop in and help you uh, from a cooperative mode perspective, right? They can kind of join in and help you out, but really it's like two different games. It's like a totally different situation. And, and that's what I find too, like even if you played, like a good example of that would be Diablo, right? Play Diablo 3, there's a campaign, you know, uh, it's kind of a more recent game. Who's ever played that? You guys played Diablo? Yeah, you play that, it's kind of a three-quarter down kind of game, you know, you play the game and you play it on your own completely. Um, you still got to be live though. You can't be really, nowadays, it's almost like you have to be constantly connected to the server uh, in order for you to play the game. You can't like play it in non-live mode, which is kind of weird. Um, but anyways, it's, it's the new mode. And then of course, when you're online, you can certainly play cooperative. You can have actually other people join the game, the campaign, and play along with you. You can also play against other players, which is in a different mode altogether. Right? Okay, so let's talk about platform a little bit. Uh, again, when we talk about game systems or platforms, so these are the words that I'm going to use in your tests. If I say console, computer, handheld, what's, there's a difference between a handheld device and mobile in terms of the way the book sees it. Mobile device nowadays is kind of what we are, new handhelds, right? Um, there aren't, there's not as much interest anymore. I'm not sure if you guys agree with something like, you know, um, a PlayStation Portable, you know, whatever it's called nowadays, um, the Vita, right? I don't think the PSP Vita is really that popular or even, because it's like limited amount of games, right? You can you kind of connect to the internet and stuff as well. Or even your, you know, your um, uh, Nintendo DS, whatever the latest version 3DS is, you know, 
I mean, really, those are the only true um, uh, handhelds that still are alive, and not for long. I don't think that that's going to last too much longer in terms of them playing stuff. Um, maybe for, for younger audiences, I can see that happening. Like, I know my, my, my little one, he likes playing with a PSP still, right? And if he smashes it, oh, well, you know, it's okay, right? Even if I have a hard shell, he'll still smash it. But um, nowadays, to me, I always look at handhelds as like mobile devices, like an iPhone or an Android phone, some kind of tablet computer or uh, iPad or whatever. Um, now, there are some distinctions, and they talk about that in the book. Uh, but remember, for me, nowadays, it's almost like, you know, we're a little bit behind the books from 2012. I've, I'm going to add content in there from 2015, right? So if you notice, there's going to be a few changes from the book to now. But I think that... Um, the distinction between handheld and mobile devices, I think mobile has really taken over that slot in terms of popularity. Um, even video arcades and stuff like that and bowling alleys, they say, uh, originally it was pizza parlors, right? Um, all that kind of stuff that, that happened in the 1980s. We talked about this actually last week when we said, yeah, you know, um, definitely, you know, cinemas and stuff like that. Um, and in, in Canada, anyway, especially in Ontario, um, you know, Cineplex Odeon, you have those little, in some, in most cases, you have this little arcade, uh, whether it's Silver City, they have, they have the brand Silver City, as an example, they have this little arcade going on. Uh, but in general, you know, video arcades, like a standalone video arcade, very rare, except for, like, like we said, uh, Palladium and those kind of places, uh, Chuck E. Cheese you know, because they have some kind of amusement area or whatever that have that. We talked about Wonderland used to have, um, you know, video uh, kind of uh, an arcade there as well. Now they're gone. Like, I don't see very often. We don't, we don't see a lot of that uh, these days. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I just don't see them around anymore, and especially not. They used to be in malls, too. You used, to used to be able to walk into a, you know, a unit in a mall, and, hey, there's your arcade. And it used to be, like, in one of the corners or whatever. Nowadays, malls are way too expensive, rent is crazy, and we just don't make enough money from video games to, to kind of justify the cost. So those things are gone. Um, I like the fact, when, when we talk about development, all right, um, and they, they talk about these three entities when it comes to arcade game development, even in the arcade. Um, there used to be this distinction between hard hardware manufacturer and game or content developer. Um, a lot of times what you had is uh, they are, they're owned by the same people, right? Like, for example, uh, Atari would own the, the actual hardware in, in the arcade as well as they would program the games for it as well, right? Um, same thing with Sega and some of those other systems out there. Uh, Sony, whatever, they all have the same kind of idea. Nowadays, they almost like produce their own video games. I think they they farm out the hardware to somebody else, but usually it's um, it's kind of a an arm's length decision. They make the game, Sony makes the game, and they farm out a you know kind of the hardware to kind of populate it in the arcade. Again, just the arcade is. I think we're at the we're at the point now where we're almost at the death of the arcade. Like you don't see a lot of people playing arcade games unless you're just waiting around for your movie to start. Nowadays, let's face it, um, we have these handheld devices that can, you know, that entertain us far more with uh, player versus player and online choices than the arcade does. And you don't have to pay anything, right, except for data. <laughs> uh, you know, so I think that's the difference. So these things here that we see here, you know, multiplayer uh, games and so on, um, a lot of this stuff is gone. Console is really big, though, still. I think there's still a big market for console. Um, and again, the three big ones are we're going to talk about our Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and Nintendo's Wii U. Those are the three big ones. Um, the Wii U, again, $299 right now, approximately in terms of cost. The, cheaper of the, the cheapest of the systems. If you were actually to go, I'm just going to escape here and go online to talk about, to kind of see what the Wii U, I was going to go to Wikipedia here. If I said, you know, Nintendo uh, Wii U. Wikipedia is actually interesting. I mean, uh, should I always look at um, a Wikipedia for stuff? Sometimes it's neat for from a stats perspective. I like looking at it from that perspective. Uh, one of the things you can look at is uh, their memory. Uh, again, CPU 1.24 gigahertz, tricore, tricore, IBM PowerPC Espresso. Um, that's the standard CPU with two gigs of, of RAM um, storage 
8 gigs of internal flash memory with a 32 gig deluxe set that you can get. Uh, of course, there's also, um, you know, the, the, uh, the way it works and everything else. They have a different kind of controller, the Wii U gamepad, which is kind of unique, right? Um, really targeted towards, um, I would say, the younger audiences. Let me go back to this for a second. So uh, children, families, all that kind of stuff. We kind of talked about that last time too. That's really what the Wii U is targeted for. So that way, that's why the stats are what they are. Big games for the Wii U still are Super Mario 3D World, Mario Kart, if you're into that kind of stuff. I know a lot of people love Mario Kart. Not a really big fan myself. Definitely for the younger um, audience. Xbox One coming in at $399 um, with, without a Kinect and $499 with a Kinect. Um, I still think, again, between the Xbox One and the, and the PS4, it's really preference at this point, right? Uh, game system-wise, they're almost identical in terms of um, their capabilities, but there's differences in the way they are, right? Um, who has an Xbox One? Anyone have an Xbox One? No? How about an Xbox 360? <laughs> yeah, some people have an Xbox 360. Xbox One, so think about that. So everyone put their hand up for Xbox 360, but no one put their hand up for Xbox One. You have an Xbox One? How about an, oh, do you? How about an X, how about a, a PS4? You got a PS4? So you have both systems. Damn. I'm, I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> I feel neglected. <laughs> Anyways, um, so what about the, the Kinect? Do you guys all have a Kinect, the one with the Kinect, or do you have the ones without the Kinect? With Kinect, right? And, isn't, and that's the way it goes. Usually, you know, if you're going to get an Xbox One, you might as well get the Kinect. That's the real uh, genius thing around the Xbox, right? To me, the Kinect, which is really this ability for you to, it's like it says here, a motion sensor camera with voice recognition, right, which is really cool. And it allows you to do all kinds of stuff. And they keep on coming out with new things around it. Um, programming Xbox One, I mean, really, there's, it's, there's, there's an SDK you can download, right? And you can literally program for the device itself. So you can include it not just for uh, the Kinect I'm talking about, not just for the, um, uh, for the Xbox, but you can actually make, it, make use of it in other devices. You can actually program your own driver for it, which people have done. Like I know that um, uh, we had some students um, a while back that kind of put it together um, in one of those, uh, they connected it to um, uh, almost like a, a toy gun, right? And they would say fire, right? And the Xbox gun would, the Xbox Connect, whatever, would listen to it, listen to their voice recognition, and they would, it would actually, you know, trigger the, the gun to fire. So very interesting, uh, you know, military applications <laughs> I'm talking about too, or security applications. But the idea behind the Kinect is very interesting. It's been around for a long time, voice recognition. It's just interesting that uh, Xbox or Microsoft has put it together um, over the last several years to make it work with the Xbox. Um, interesting things for Microsoft because every game console has almost like unique or I don't even want to call it um, exclusive games that are only available to it. Uh, and again, um, they do things like Call of Duty, of course, Battlefield, all that kind of stuff um, is totally available on both platforms. I think those are kind of uh, bigger games still. Uh, they're the big ones. Um, there's other ones as well. Titanfall probably would be probably one of the biggest ones nowadays. And Destiny, those are the two big ones this year for Xbox One. Right? I don't know if you guys would agree. Actually, it's, av it's available on, on, uh, on PS4 as well, Destiny, right? But, uh, but that Titanfall would be, you know, the exclusive game for the console, right? So that's the one that, you know, you, you hear about a lot. It's kind of a cool game. I've seen it. I've, I've played it. Uh, a couple friends might have it. I mean, again, to me, you know, they're, they're getting into this more and more of the, of the 3D world kind of thing. A lot more PvP battles, right? Uh, which is interesting that they do that kind of thing. And less and less story arc and campaign, which is weird, right? I mean, for me, I'm always into the, I want to play the game on my own. <laughs> you know, I mean, not that I don't want to play with other people, but, you know, uh, whenever I put on my headset, I always hear all kinds, especially on the Xbox network, there's a million things, people are swearing all over the place, and I can never include my little one on it at all. I'm like, shield your ears. I can't, don't listen to this, these stupid people going on and telling each other to go, you know, whatever to themselves. Right? Um, so, you know, uh, it's kind of weird. There's no moderator. That's the one thing I, I don't know if you guys notice this when you're on the, you know, um, Xbox Live or whatever. And same thing with PlayStation Network. It's like there's no moderator. Anything can, ha anything can bloody happen, right? Um, which I don't like. 
That's one thing. I, I mean, it's fun when you're younger, you know, and, and you see an idiot come on with a modded, a modded box, like a modded console, and he can do stuff that you, it's impossible, right, for some reason. Um, it's fun to see weird people like that, but it's not fun when you get killed over and over again, right? Um, and, and especially when you respawn in the middle of a battle and, and you know, you're getting killed by the same guy. I don't know if you noticed that. Latency is a big thing, too, when you're playing um, player versus player with uh, Xbox One and PSP, uh, the PS, uh, PS4 on the, on the PlayStation Network. Uh, if you have really bad latency, it's a real big disadvantage for you. So if you're, like, out in the boondocks, right, and you can't get, like, really good internet speeds, don't bother. <laughs> You'll get killed so quickly. Um, and the other interesting thing is some of these, uh, these multiplayer environments, you're, you're, we're, we're talking about console here, but if you play... Uh, console play, Xbox Live, is also available to, because um, it's Microsoft, other non-console kind of games. You can kind of, a lot of times, you might have a guy that's on a PC, and you might have a guy on an Xbox as well for certain games, which is also kind of weird in terms of latency and disadvantage. Anyway, so again, so every every console has this advantage and disadvantage. Uh, definitely Xbox One, if I was to escape back out to... Um, um, to Wikipedia just for a second, just to kind of look at what the cost of an Xbox One would be, and and uh, not the cost, but the um, if I go Xbox One for a second. It's interesting what they, you know, that we can get some information about the actual console itself uh, nowadays. Again, uh, they say US four ninety nine. It's interesting, Canada four ninety nine, right? So this has come down a little bit uh, since this this article was up. Here's one, CPU, custom 1.75 gigahertz AMD 8-core APU. So actually there's two quad cores uh, tied together, right? That's what it is. So a really decent uh, CPU combination. More than most people have at home in their PCs nowadays. Let's let, I mean, who has an 8-core anything, right? So that's really cool. That's a really cool thing. 8 gigs of RAM, uh, DDR3, and 5 gig available for to play games, which is, I think, plenty of... of uh, of memory to play the games, 500 gig storage in a hard drive form. Um, the display supports 4K, 1080p, 720p. So again, way better than the than the uh, poor Nintendo Wii U, right? Uh, way different. It's almost like a whole different class of of console. Uh, 7.1 surround sound, HDMI input, and so on. And of course, the Kinect, right? So backward compatibility. This is a big one that that bothered me when I first saw the Xbox One. I was like, God damn it, right? I have to go and sell up my Xbox 360 games. I want to get an Xbox One, um, so that that bug that bugged me a little bit. And compared to the Xbox 360, its predecessor, and there was two different versions. Some of the earlier, I mean, between the white Xbox and the black Xbox, I think the one thing that that uh, that they changed a lot of stuff was in the as the internals, so you didn't get that ring of death as mo as often, right? I got the ring of death like within about a year after playing the Xbox intensely, right? Play the Xbox enough, you get that, you know the ring of death, and it's just, you know, you have to go find someone to fix it, right? And at the same time, why not mod it anyway, right? Might as well mod the game, mod the Xbox. Anyway, so um, it was a 3.2 gig uh, power PC tri-core Xenon processor. Again, a Xenon processor being a non-standard processor for home. So much more powerful processor than the average PC when it first came out, right? 512 mega RAM, so now it went from got 8 gigs from 512, so a real kick up in performance and power, right? So you get some real performance um, happening. And from a storage perspective, I mean, they get they had, I think, 200 megabit, me megabytes, or 250 megabytes, 500 megabytes, not even a gig of, of RAM storage, right? So it was kind of interesting. So um, they, did, they did include the, the Kinect on the Xbox 360 um, later on in the, on the black Xbox this this uh, later version, so called the Xbox Elite, I think if it was if I'm not wrong or um, I forget what it was called. There's a different version of it uh, that came out, but anyways, um, it kind of made it a little better and almost like it was a minor upgrade, right? Um, compared to the see the e, Xbox Elite, compared to the this Xbox Premium with the hard drive on the outside like that. So enough about Xbox. I mean, I was a big a big fan of, of the Xbox 360. It had its run. Man, they make the Microsoft make its money from the Xbox 360. It lasts for a long, long time, right? And as you can see, I mean, it came out. When was the release date of this? Or this the original model came out in when? Uh, yeah, 2005, November 2005, and we just replaced it. What is it? A couple of years ago now, right? 
So that's a really good run. That's like years and years of sucking back the, the profit from the Xbox 360. Um, on the other hand, if I was to go to the PlayStation, PlayStation 4, let's say, right? And um, <clears throat> again, it's interesting that Wikipedia has, and we'll talk about it, PlayStation in a bit. If I was com to compare it, 8 gigs of RAM, again, CPU, semi-custom 8-core again, an AMD X86 64-bit uh, Jaguar, so almost identical to the Microsoft uh, version of the Xbox uh, One. Um, and it's a secondary low power processor for background tasks, which is a kind of different thing that the Xbox uh, One does not have. So there was a different, it is definitely a different design, the way they've done things. Um, but interesting that they came up with the same kind of thing, eight gigs of, of, of RAM uh, unified with a 256 mega, a megabyte DDR3 RAM for background tasks, so secondary RAM again. So two processor cores, if you will. One that's an 8-core, and then a secondary one to take care of other things. That's awesome. Parallel processing is what we're calling this right now, right? Um, really good graphics. Again, on par, if not better than the Xbox One, I would say. Um, do I prefer the, the, the PlayStation over the Xbox One? No. I think they've both got their, you know, their nuances, their, their things that are good and bad. Again, from an HDMI perspective, 480p, 720p, 480p, 720p, 1080i, 1080p, 4K, uh, for pictures and videos only. But it's interesting that um, you know they've what they're able to do. And remember, think about what Sony's doing nowadays. Sony closed down all their stores in Canada, if I'm not wrong, um, over the last uh, several months. Right? Microsoft is opening new stores. Right? They got the one store at Yorkdale. Right? Microsoft, uh, the Microsoft store. Um, and but then Sony's gone. So. It's interesting the the dynamic. It's almost like Sony has high-end TVs and, and uh, um, electronics, and they've come up with their PS4. But you know, in terms of the life of the company, I'm just cons I'm concerned when I see when I saw Sony closing down. I'm like, does that mean the PS4 is going to go too? Because that means that's a whole generation of of consoles that uh, uh, that they make, and it's a great competitor uh, to Microsoft. In fact, if anything, it's probably the most successful one right now in the market. More, more successful than Microsoft at this stage. We'll see how it goes. Let's go back to this. So again, that's the PlayStation 4 from a, from a, a, um, a platform perspective. Um, again, it comes in about 449. So Microsoft's with Connect, 499, <laughs> 50, bu 50 bucks less, you're getting a PlayStation 4 with, I would say, which is more, more popular than the Xbox One. You're getting a better system and with almost the exact same games. There's, there, are, there are some exclusive games you can't get because it's Microsoft exclusive only, but at the end of the day, you're getting a great experience, right? So um, one of the games that they talked about uh, when I did my research on this one was uh, MLB, right? Major League Baseball. It's one thing, if you're a baseball fan or a sports fan, it's almost like Major League Baseball, they're, they're saying, is, is gone. Any kind of sports games in general for these two platforms, gone. But the, the PlayStation 4 has kind of an amazing game, um, for, for, especially for baseball. Again, there's in terms of um, exclusive games, The Last of Us, uh, they say that's kind of a big one. And Infamous Second Son, right? To me, I love that game. That's a great game, right? If you guys play that game at all on, on, on the PS4, that's a, it's a really, really good game. And of course, you can still play Destiny and some of the other games that are really cool that are out there right now for both platforms. And there they are. Those are the three um, the, the, that are the big contenders nowadays. Um, so now that most of you guys are here, right, I'm going to kind of pull up uh, one of the things I like to do when we're together <coughs> is, you know, so that way you guys aren't bored to tears when we do this. I'm going to put together a little poll, right, instead of a raise of hands. And I'll say, uh, ah, what's your favorite console? Right. And I'm going to put in a couple of options here. Uh, let's let's talk about this. So we'll say PS4, right? We'll do the Xbox One. These are the big three, right? And the the, the um, we'll add another one that's that we'll, we'll call um, Wii U. Some people might like that, you know. And we'll also put other. Because maybe they're, you know, we're not talking about computer here. We're just talking about console, right? So only consoles, 
what's your favorite one. Um, well, I'm not going to add another one. Let's delete this one. And we'll create this thing. Now, I do these little polls because the great thing is it gives you a, a chance to anonymously answer the poll. And you can join it at, you can text LEARN to 37607, right? And then choose A, B, C, or D. Or you can also go to pollev.com forward slash learn and answer your question. So go ahead. There's your online poll for today. Yes? It's supposed to be PS4 first, Xbox One second, and then Wii U. It's uh, supposed to be. When do they, when are they oh, for Wii U and Xbox, you mean? Yeah. They switch places? Oh, that I didn't know. Which, which problems do they have? Huh? Other. Uh, which one? What's, what's it called? Smash Brothers for for which one? For something else? Like another? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's true. It's true. So I, a lot of people PS4, but there's who's other? What's the other ones? I'm, I'm curious about what the other is. GameCube. Yeah. Well, you know, some people are have uh, the older ones, the older systems out there as well. But it's interesting how uh, where's it? One, two, three, four, five. I'll wait for other people to answer. Other, another other. Right? Isn't that interesting? Right? That people are coming up with other something else. Right, other than the the big the big three, right? Oh, there's one Xbox. Ah, come on, I'm glad someone's at Xbox One, right? If you're a Microsoft fan, you know to me one one of the things that I notice is if you're a Microsoft fan, you're into the Microsoft like the whole uh, you know um, Microsoft Live Xbox Live kind of uh, uh, network. If you're into that, it's almost like you stuck with Xbox One. So if you're a true gamer, you have like you guys said, you guys have both platforms you can fool around with, kick around with, right? And maybe other ones, um, but it's interesting to to learn this kind of th to, to understand where you guys sit. Because obviously, I'm not going to be talking too much about the Wii U in this class, except except for maybe Mario Kart. If you guys like that kind of thing, but I'm not a big Mario Kart fan. Never was. I thought it was always kind of meh. It was okay, but uh, the young guys they really like it. Like I said. Okay, so that's that poll. Um, <clears throat> So I kind of I kind of do that once in a while. I want to understand. Sometimes what I'll do also with the live polls uh, for live participation is I want to also understand like to, to shoot you some questions, like right from the uh, almost like test questions that you might see on the test. So if you see some of the questions on your uh, uh, on the live poll, uh, these are the, almost the, I will take a selection of these they, these questions and put them on your uh, in on the theoretical part of your tests, just because you know. More interesting than than reading the book. All right, so the big containers. Then there's the computer. Um, again, I think the, the two things that you need to know for the from a computer perspective, for those people who don't know, is that I mean, if you're going to build your own rig, um, you're building it because you want to meet. You don't want to meet the minimum requirements. You're meeting the recommended specs and then some. Like you know, that's what you want to try and do. And again, these days, I don't know if you guys have your own gaming rig at all at home. And I'm, when I say things like your own custom machine that you've built, right? Um, if you're, a lot of people are into that. You have a custom keyboard, custom mouse, you know, custom chair. <laughs> you made your own little cave. Man came, cave, another cave, right? That you got to go into. Um, and you have your own controls and everything else. I used to do that when I was, when I was a little younger and unmarried without, without my four kids. I had uh, all kinds of extra money that I could, uh, you know, uh, throw into my computer, and I found the PC platform to me was was a little better, more controllable than the the console. But now I find that consoles are it's literally mindless. I go there, I turn it on, it works. I don't have to go and plug it in. I don't have to configure it. I don't have to sit there and find out if my this game works over the other game. And the installation is a lot easier. Um, you know, it's standard. Uh, the mid the game. I mean, the the problem with uh, a PC is every PC is different, right? You and I can go buy a PC today. And, um, you know, my, the stuff that's in my PC is going to be different than the stuff that's in your PC. And that's why they have this whole minimum specs and recommended specs uh, to get their game. Nowadays, uh, definitely you want to do things with a, a PC that's at least 64-bit. You, you, you don't want any older PCs that, that are 32-bit. And arguably, you want to have as much RAM as possible. Um, for me, I mean, you know, for the average PC, you have at least 16 gigs nowadays. Um, with a couple gigs, at least the minimum video RAM that you want to use, if not a lot more. So, who's got a really powerful PC at home that you know that you kind of use? That's good. You build it yourself? 
Yeah, how much did it cost you? On average. 18 grand? Oh. <laughs> I was like, holy crap. <laughs> you outdid me, man. I was like, I was like, I, I did. 1800 that's kind of, that's interesting. Anyone else build their own? Um, mine went up to five. Five grand was the most I ever spent on my, on my PC, but that's only because I bought the latest and greatest video card. I wanted, I was crazy. I wanted to buy the latest CPU. Nowadays, of course, you can shop around. Amazon.ca is really good for that, um, as well as other places to get your own stuff, put things together. But like I said in last week, it's just cheaper nowadays to buy a, you know, kind of a box that's already made and modify it. I had to drop in a custom video card, take out the one that, that the manufacturer gave you, um, you know, change the drivers and so on. The other thing I got to talk about from a computer game perspective, it talks about PC, right? Um, but it doesn't talk about, a lot about Mac or Linux. And the reason for that is because, for now, most games are made for, the, for Microsoft Windows, right? They're not made as well for, for, uh, uh, for OS X. And I know because I have, I have my Mac. I have other, other Apple kind of computers at home as well. And they're just, there are games for, for OS X, but they come out a lot later than the PC, that's for sure. And um, they don't have the same kind of, I mean, in terms of graphic quality and so on, I just get way, there's just way more uh, selection from a, uh, from a PC perspective compared to the, uh, you know, uh, a Mac OS uh, kind of game. So that's the platform. Um, online would be definitely um, something we can play. And again, you know, you instead of it being native, something that's native to your, uh, uh, you know, to your machine. So you have some kind of native um, installation pieces, right? Like, for example, if you download and install, I don't know, World of Warcraft, even today, right? You have this native piece you got to install, right? That handles kind of your client. And then most of the game is going on. You can't even play the game, um, really, unless you play online. Uh, not the real game. Anyways, so... This whole idea of, of uh, MMOs and all that kind of stuff, if, if you guys aren't into that these days, I mean, that's the main thing that's going on these days. And that's what's probably going to happen a lot at uh, this Game Enthusiast Live, right? Um, all this online stuff and, and player versus player mode um, and all that kind of stuff. It's very rare that you play campaign games. Campaigns, like single player campaigns, meh. A lot of, there's not as much interest. Why? It's more interesting to play um, online against someone else. Um, one thing I have to say from an online perspective is we talked about a couple things. One is connectivity issues. I would also say latency is a big one. It has not as big nowadays as it used to be. I'll be honest with you. Back in my day when I first did online stuff, latency was huge. You know, imagine you're a sniper and you're on a you you know, you're snipering somebody and you've got him in your sights and all of a sudden he gone, right? Where'd he go? Right? He's just there. Latency, right? <laughs> he was there, but what you see and what what the we you know what the server is seeing is totally different things. You can you can try and fire a bullet at somebody, and by the time it gets there, he's gone. Right, that's bad. Um, nowadays, it doesn't happen as often. Although I'll I'll tell you the the busier and during busier times, I don't know if you noticed this, where you jump, you're like, you know, here you're on an online game, and all of a sudden psh, you're over here. Right, it's almost like what the sh the computer shows you and what the what the server is telling you is totally different. So it's, there's still somewhat of an issue. It really depends on how popular, how busy the, the servers are that you join. And that's why they have a series of servers you can join. Which one do you want to join? This one, this one, this one? Because sometimes these servers have a really big loads. Um, the other one that like I, I kind of mentioned at, at the beginning, which is player misbehavior. Like, you know, players that kind of gang up on you. Um, you know, I'm talking about in a, in a cooperative kind of campaign where you can actually, you know, do like friendly fire. <laughs> like by accident, oh, you know, I died because of friendly fire. Some guy like chopped me in half. He didn't like me, you know, and we're playing a cooperative game, right? Um, a lot of swearing and stuff like that going on. Um, the one thing that's really interesting with online stuff is the ability for you to sell virtual items. That's interesting. Um, I know back in the day, we used to be able to sell stuff. Um, there was a, um, I had a colleague of mine, we used to work at Bell, and um, I always saw him, you know, he was tired as hell coming in, right? So he'd come in and I'm like, dude, what's going on? His name was Jason. Jason, what's going on? How come you're uh, you're so tired? And he would say, "Oh man, I was up all night selling." <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And he would sell, you know, virtual items like some kind of crazy character that was like a hundred level or whatever. He would sell, and um, he claimed that he was making more money than we were being we were paid. You know, we were being paid a bell to work at the time. And this is back in the day. We're talking about ten years plus when it was like a big thing. 
and it was not as regulated as it is now. Now there's regulations involved, there's rules in terms of selling stuff to other people more than there used to be. Before, no rules. And that's why they had these, you know, so-called, and I think they probably still do that, these so-called farms, you know, these uh, gold farms and so on, where you can, you know, um, teams of people that would kind of join in and, and farm for gold and buy different items and, and, and basically level up characters because of the gold. Yes? Yeah, like, um, I used some game before like, See what I'm saying? It's not uncommon still, but it's like, it's like there are. I know it's it's it, it's almost like an urban myth these days, you know, an urban legend that you hear here's some guy paying off his you know university tuition or his rent or whatever by selling virtual items, but it still happens, right? It depends on the server, the game. There's more regulations like rules on how to do it, what to do. They kind of stop you from doing it as much nowadays, but it still happens. You can still level up, and actually they've made it so it's part of the game now. I mean, you can buy your character if you have a lot of money. You can go into Diablo and say, okay, I'm going to buy a 100 level character. Cool. <laughs> right? And you're good to go. But that kind of takes the fun out of things for me. Right? But they, what they're doing is they're, they're kind of going with the wave. They're saying, look, instead of letting them do it, some other guy uh, profiting from our game, let's profit it from ourselves. Let's give it, give it a, um, you know, players an option. If they want to pay, let's, let's take the money ourselves. Right? Which is kind of a smart marketing uh, maneuver. Um, <clears throat> so there's Xbox Live and the PlayStation Store that used to be. Now it's a little bit different than that. Handheld. Again, I don't want to talk too much handheld because not as popular these days. Again, especially with the, the 3DS and all that kind of stuff. They used to be big, um, but definitely not as big anymore with the PS Vita being the last iteration of Sony's PlayStation Portable. right? I think they're going to go bye-bye for myself. I don't think there's a market for them right now. Uh, especially when you can buy a um, um, a portable, uh, like a mobile device, like uh, an iPod, even that gives you more choices nowadays in terms of games than one of these, and and really good graphics uh, relative to what these things can do. Plus, uh, connectivity choices going on the internet, and just in terms of everything else you get, like PlayStation Vita is still pretty expensive relative to you know to buying even an iPad Mini as an example, right? I don't know what you would choose compared to that, but I might choose an iPad mini. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, we went from handhelds and, you know, mobile devices took over some of the same space that the handheld devices have. And of course, these are the most uh, common or modern devices, the iPhone 6, the Galaxy S6, the iPad Air 2, Galaxy Tab 4. Those are kind of like where we are today. Who's got, uh, who's got let's say, a Galaxy S6? Anyone? It's kind of the latest, greatest Android phone. How about an iPhone 6? I got one. I got an iPhone 6. You got an iPhone 6? You know, I didn't want to get the iPhone 6. Um, I was happy with my iPhone 4S. That was good, right? I didn't want to go to a 5. I, I kind of wait as much as I can for uh, for the technology to, to mature a little bit. Like, for example, the iPhone 6S, which is probably going to come out this summer sometime or the by fall, um, if, you're, if you're an Apple guy uh, or girl. Uh, they're going to come up with some some improvements to it. I mean, you know, they, they need to do that. Um, and they're going to have a new processor, a better... It's the same thing. They just keep on coming up with a better camera, better processor. Um, you know, it'll handle different things. Um, things like the stuff that the Android handled from before. For example, NFC. It's, it's supposed to be a really big thing now with Apple Pay and iPhone 6, where they've had it on Android for a while. How about an iPad? Anyone have an iPad at all? Any kind of iPad? I have an iPad 2. Um... I don't have an Air 2 or an Air. How about the Galaxy Tab? Anyone have a Galaxy Tab? Any other kind of tablets out there? You guys have tablets at all? Yeah? What do you got? Someone has a, yeah. How about a Surface, a Microsoft Surface? Anyone have that? It's, again, not as popular in terms of tablet choice or computer. It's almost like I'm, I have a, a tablet-like computer that I'm going to use. I know a lot of people have seen people with, tab with uh, the Surface. I think the disadvantage right now is, even now from a Surface 3 perspective, which is out, I mean, there's a lot of claims that it won't even support Windows 10, which is the latest operating system coming out in July, right? Which is kind of weird. But again, from a mobile platform perspective, one of the things that i got to talk about here that um, revolutionized kind of handhelds and kind of pushed the handhelds out of the market altogether pretty much was the ability for you to have one device to do everything, right? So one device, you have your phone, you have your, you know, MP3 player equivalent, because back then, remember, we used to have separate MP3 players. You guys probably are uh, old enough to remember that, right? 
Um, and they still have them today for, for sport uses. You can still buy a portable MP3 player, and so you don't have to use your phone to run around and get sweaty, right? You can do that today still. But typically, for now, you can use one device to do everything with. Email, uh, business, you know, music, games, um, development, artwork. I mean, everyone has a camera in their pocket, now, a pocket nowadays with video, like a video camera. No one had these things before, and that's, that's what... Um, this this one device to rule the uh, the mall uh, kind of um, um, kind of has given us one thing that the book doesn't cover, which is fairly new, is wearables, right? And we got to talk about that a little bit, like the whole idea of uh, uh, the Apple Watch and all that kind of stuff. Like we kind of mentioned that um, we've been talking about wearables in the in the industry for about I would say I don't know probably fifteen or twenty years now, right? Um, they just haven't kicked off. We used to have a wearable cell phone way back in the day. I used to work for Bell, and they came up with this wearable cell phone that almost looked like a Star Trek communicator, like literally. It was about this big, so the size of like a watch today, like a watch face, and you would hang it around your neck on a chain, right? You could tap it to make a call. It, was, it, was, it existed back in the day, right? Um, never took off, right? It was made, I think it was a Motorola special back in the day, right? Then they had the flip phones, you know, the whole function phone idea. That they used to have, they still exist today. A lot of people still have those simple function function phones, right? Uh, you know that came out before. But you know, as they came out, wearables, you know, things like a wearable um, nowadays is we use a lot of times for fitness apps, right? Um, that's going to change. I really believe that wearables are going to be something different than what we see today, right? One of the challenges with wearables are the price, right, and the small screen size. So. How can you play a game on an on Apple Watch? It's going to be tough. It's going to be a different kind of game than we play on an iPhone or, or a, uh, on an iPad. So because the, the interface is going to be slightly different, so smaller. So what do we do with it? We do different things. That's the answer. Um, the same thing with when we talked about the iPad, you know, or tablet kind of computers. The problem with us getting a tablet is people still divide, they kind of make games for the viewport, right? But that's, you got to think about it. It's not just a viewport exercise when we make a game for an iPad. They have different things. The iPad gives us, and so, so do other tablets, other options, not just swiping gestures. And other, they have, there's an accelerometer. We don't take advantage of that as much. Um, there's different things that we still haven't tapped into. And you're going to see still a wave of games that are going to tap into things like native device support that a lot of a lot of games don't take take advantage of as much these days, especially with this whole haptic response stuff that, that have come up with the Apple Watch. The whole idea for you to feel physical, like there's almost like a, uh, you know, they actually kind of had that more on the BlackBerry side, where you actually feel the buttons. Even though they're virtual buttons, you can feel there's a little bit of texture on the screen that was created by uh, different kinds of haptic technologies. So the mobile platform still developing. Uh, took over uh, handheld, and I, I would say that we're going to see handheld, whatever exists today, disappear altogether pretty soon, and maybe even replaced by wearables as something of, a, of another platform. Tabletop games. Let's talk about non-electronic games like Dungeons and Dragons and games like Warhammer 40K, right? And those kind of things, right? Who ever does? Who plays Warhammer 40K or Warhammer modeling games, right? How about uh, other kind of board games like or tabletop games like Dungeons and Dragons or uh, Traveler or one of those. Anyone, anyone play that kind of stuff? You guys aren't gamers like that, eh? Yes. Oh, he's brave enough to put his hand up and say, "I'm a role player. I'm a nerd, just like I am." I guess. Yes, it is. You know what? Um, it's interesting. You know what? I think one of the things that they do. They mentioned that is one thing we do as developers is, hey, if you're going to make a game nowadays, can you make a um, tabletop version of your game that has your game mechanics that work? I think it's a great exercise. Try it out. Think about a game you want to make, even if it's a side scroller or some other kind of 2D game because you're into 2D games, right? Make it first on on your tabletop, right? See if it works game mechanics wise. If you're going to make it, you know, have turns or whatever, even if it's real time, how does the game play out? Almost create your own little prototype, if you will, and you'll see that it helps you with programming. It helps you with designing the game itself. One of the concept phases we do for for some of these more complex games is create almost like these tabletop prototypes which I like a lot. Um, and the other thing to understand is, um, one thing I should mention actually is playability versus realism. Right? I don't know if you guys have this conflict sometimes when you make a game. I want to make a game, but I want to make it super realistic. What's the disadvantage for me making it super realistic? Anybody? 
So I want to make as realistic as possible. Can anyone think about a, a programming disadvantage? Yeah. Controls, yeah, okay, but you still have some kind of, that's a human interface thing, right? But I want to make it super realistic, super realistic, so it's exactly, yeah. Oh, yeah, the complexity is huge, right? Will you ever finish a game like that? You may not, right? Actually, it's the same thing. If you ever play a tabletop game like, like uh, Dungeons and Dragons or something like that, right? So imagine a super realistic version. The normal version of Dungeons and Dragons, you roll a 20-sided die to hit, right? That's an example. You roll a 20-sided die, you roll into the range where you can hit, because you're depending on your character, you get bonuses and minuses and so on. This is the game mechanic, right? If I hit, I hit, I do damage. Roll damage. Okay? Now I want to make it super realistic. The D20 and Dungeons and Dragons don't tell you where you hit. So I want to make it super realistic. I want to hit the guy in the eye. Okay, fine. How do I gain how do I create a mechanic to hit the guy in the eye now from a tabletop perspective? Well, that means I may need to hit, I may need to use other kinds of dice. Maybe percentile dice, so from 1 to 100. Okay, fine. If So I hit. Now I make a secondary roll to see where I hit. Or maybe instead of two dice, I'm rolling three dice at once. Two dice to see where I, uh, that, that I hit, and the third die to see where, from 0 to 10, my head to my whatever, I'm hitting. Just that alone becomes more complex. Now I'm hitting a specific location. Fine. Do I have armor in that location? Because remember, D&D, &D, standard D&D, &D, if you have armor, it prevents you from hitting. It's not, there's no armor plating, as an example. How much armor do I have here compared to here compared to here? If you go super realistic, the more realistic uh, games have armor pieces in different places that propose, you know, kind of uh, pose a different programming challenge if you're going to program it. Well, now I need to keep track of, of armor in different hit locations, right? And what about getting hit in a hit location? If I, if I hit you in the head, is there a different lasting effect than if I hit you in the arm? There should be, because a head hit should be harder to get more realistic, right? But we're going to try and aim for the head a lot, right? Because let's even real life, if you're going to hit a guy, you're going to hit a guy in the head, you're not going to hit him in the arm, right? Because you want to take him out, right? So if we're talking about combat games, you know, the more realistic you get, the more complex it gets, you write yourself into a black hole, and sometimes it becomes very expensive exercise. And also, less fun sometimes. The more complex you get, the less fun it is, because you get bogged down in rules and uh, the game mechanics. So there's always got to be this balance. If you can take anything away from what I just said, take away this. There's always got to be a balance between realism versus playability when it comes to games. Um, let's see where we're at with, uh, with this thing. I think I want to stop it there. We're kind of at the halfway mark um, in terms of time interval. We talked about different platforms. And I think time interval is a whole other section I want to cover next day. So we'll talk, talk about that on Friday. Uh, let's take a brief break and then get back into Blender. We'll talk about Blender uh, a little bit more after this.